domestic violence, um, financial crimes, and related legal needs. Uh, this webinar is to highlight how some programs have adjusted their work. Um, you can go ahead and send questions in throughout the webinar. I will be monitoring the Q&A box um, and it will be recorded. So we've got me from NLADA, we've got Deep D from Legal Services of Northern Virginia, um, we have Kathy who is, um, who is trying to get onto this webinar, and we have Arielle from SEDEC DC. If you have any follow-up questions regarding um, this webinar or NLADA's role, you can reach out to Radhika Singh. She is the Chief of Civil Legal Services at NLADA, and I've put her email down at the bottom for you all. All right, so here's a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about NLADA's resources as they relate to COVID-19. And then we'll hear from Deepti from Legal Services of Northern Virginia, Kathy um, from Prairie State Legal Services, and Arielle from SEDEC DC. We might switch around Kathy and Ariel, depending on um, getting Kathy on this webinar. Um, and then we will end with some Q&A. So NLADA is working to coordinate experts in both the delivery of legal services and access to justice, as well as experts in specific practice areas and leaders in providing legal aid and public defense. Um, we have created an online space for advocates to share resources, discuss responses and strategies with each other, identify experts in particular issues, and find policy developments affecting the delivery of legal services. This page is updated and, and is expanding um, as the pandemic and its collateral consequences continue to develop. Um, this page is broken down by substantive area and includes both policy updates as well as practice resources that are relevant to legal aid. You can access it here, and I should also note that all of the slides are going to be, update, uh, going to be uploaded to NLADA's webinar um, webpage. We also have uh, co-created a funding chart with um, the Justice in Government Project, which is one of our national partners, and it includes specific updates guidance included related to federal funding for legal service providers that are not um, federal funding that's not LSC related. We have additional resources um, as you're looking and thinking about how to fund this work. We have a grants forecasting guide that we also published with the Justice and Government Project, as well as a website that we maintain, legalaidresources.org. Um, we publish information about um, grants as they are announced. You can sign up for email alerts. Please do so that way you can be notified whenever we post a new, um, a new funding opportunity for you. I should also highlight that we say what type of legal services or um, what the focus area is and if there's any express language for legal aid or if it's something that would allow for legal aid, something like um, this grant will fund supportive services and legal aid is um, eligible to apply within that. We also are working to, um, to make the evidence base uh, that shows why legal aid works more accessible to the community. Um, we have a website called Legal Aid Research. This is a Legal Aid Resources companion page, and it includes hundreds of research summaries on um, certain topic areas um, that show why legal aid works. We also have a newsletter called Just Research that we've put together with the Justice and Government Project. It's a monthly newsletter. It uh, highlights the, the newest and hottest research, um, as well as uh, policy updates related to specific areas. And then we also, I also want to highlight um, the Justice and Government Project. If you haven't checked out their toolkit, um, that works to make the research accessible, provide information about funding, and then give examples of how states have accessed that. I highly recommend you check that out. So without further ado, I will hand this on over to Deepti, um, who is from Legal Services of Northern Virginia to talk about, um, 
to talk about their work with domestic violence. So Deepti, you now have presenter privileges, so you can scroll through the slides on the left-hand side underneath um, the number eight. Great, thank you. I don't see it moving. You can also tell me when you want to move to the next slide and I can do that for you. Sure, <laughs> please advance, thank you. <laughs> it might be the easiest option. The next slide, please, thank you. All right, I'm going to take back presenter privileges so that way I can move through these slides. <laughs> All right, so here's your here's your cover page. Thank you. Next slide. Okay. Great. There we are. <laughs> Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, you know, as we were planning for this, the one thing I said, a big challenge is going to be keeping up with changes because I feel like everyone has information overload and um, each day presents a new challenge. Um, so I think it's important to kind of regroup and see what we're seeing today. Um, I, I think our services um, have been changing um, daily, if not weekly, uh, based on the needs. Um, with regard to our services um, assisting victims of domestic violence, initially there, have, there were a decrease in the number of uh, phone calls. Um, our local jurisdiction here, Fairfax County, just released a report where they highlighted the decrease, but then they showed that as of the week of March 8th, there was a 30%, I'm sorry, well, there was a 30% decrease in calls and then um, the hotline experienced increase. Um, and this was, there was also a significant increase for uh, compared to the same period last year. Um, they are showing that there's more severe types of abuse and threats. Um, for example, uh, victims are being threatened to exposure to COVID, threatened with deportation, um, or they're being threatened with weapons. Um, access is also more difficult with social isolation. There's also some other uh, stressors, which include lack of access to healthcare, uh, financial hardships, and food insecurity. Um, in terms of who is calling, there shows that there is an increase um, in calls from family and friends of victims concerned um, about their safety. Um, next slide, please. Social isolation um, has been a key factor in trying to reach out to victims. Um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, victims are um, the increased, the intensifying um, of isolation um, might increase danger with a partner. They might be hesitant to call. Um, children are also at increased risk to uh, domestic violence uh, at this time. Um, for our local jurisdiction reports um, to the Child Protective Services decreased uh, 85% um, since March 1st of this year. Uh, due to uh, COVID restrictions, there have been an increase in the number of clients um, attending protective order hearings without representation and an increase in the number of clients non-suiting in, in, in Virginia, that means just dismissing uh, the final protective order hearing. Clients are reporting feeling um, increased feelings of fear, loneliness, anxiety, depression. Um, they're concerned about lack of financial resources. A number, a, a high issue is visitation. It's consistently raised as a concern. Um, parents have questions about whether or not they need to comply. Um, and there's also a concern about victims and survivors um, in marginalized community being supported, especially uh, those from undocumented communities. Um, next slide, please. 
So we uh, there's uh, we are focusing on in court advocacy and out out of court advocacy. Uh, we you know the one lesson we learned is getting involved with uh, court committees early on and talk to them um, about access and technology. Um, right now, our domestic relations court is able to offer remote filing for the preliminary protective orders um, to clients who are unable to travel to the courthouse. Um, they can conduct their appointments with intake officers via Teams. Um, they can also use their phones um, the documents which need uh, signatures are emailed uh, to, to the client through DocuSign. Um, it's a company that provides secure electronic signing of documents. Um, then these documents are printed and signed by the intake officer and then submitted to the court. We've, uh, are, they've been a number of successful uh, hearings that were completed. Um, and then clients with uh, General intake, civil intake needs such as visitation, custody, and child support will uh, call the clerk's office. Um, with regard to remote hearings, we are uh, breaking it down before court, during court, and after court in uh, preparing. Uh, before court, you are encouraging attorneys to contact the court, practice with the client, check the technology, um, and make sure both parties consent these hearings. Um, in some instances, in early on, there were what we're calling hybrid hearings where uh, you might have one attorney rem appearing rep remotely and another appearing or a pro se party that appear in person. Um, and that could present challenges. Right now, uh, if you want to appear remotely, you will be, uh, the clerk's office will send you uh, instructions. Um, you can file your uh, precipice uh, uh, to have the remote appearance. You'll receive instructions. Um, we've had a, a few hearings, um, you know, a shaky start, but I think it's definitely improving. You want to make sure, again, you practice with your client. When you are actually at the hearing, you want to look at the platform you're using to um, know the different options. Number one is how are you going to communicate with your client. Um, there may be mute functions. Um, you may be able to go to a different room. Uh, one option is if you have a large office and you can, or a conference room, if you can social distance, you, both of uh, you and your client perhaps could be present in the conference room and remotely call into court. Um, and with regard to interpreters, you want to see if there can be contemporaneous uh, translation. If not, that will also take up time. If you do need to communicate with your client and you need to mute or go to a different room, the interpreter may you need to set it up so that the interpreter can follow as well. With regard to evidence presentation, um, we advise planning, pre-planning is going to be very important, exchanging documents. If there is an issue of new evidence, uh, objecting will be important, um, especially if uh, it's a document that you're unable to see that, and you know that um, has presented challenges um, in the past. Next slide, please. Thank you. In terms of out of court advocacy, we are um, part of coordinated response streams in our community, and we uh, have meetings to discuss concerns and uh, about social services needs that are unmet. Currently, our police department victim services, they're still available to victims and they uh, conduct advocacy through uh, phone, Zoom, um, FaceTime. Uh, many of them are teleworking, uh, tele, sorry, teleworking and uh, they are available. Uh, there's also counseling services that are currently available to current clients and they hope to make teletherapy and distance counseling available to do new um, individuals and family clients soon. Um, I, overcoming challenges to isolation and tech is uh, one of our number one concerns. Um, recently, you know, uh, we, we did a uh, outreach uh, using a conference call so that you don't have to have a smartphone, you don't have to um, have Wi-Fi. We also did a Zoom outreach um, 
focused on uh, domestic violence in the Black community, as you know, there are um, racial dis well, racial disparities existed prior to COVID in intimate partner violence among women of color for a number of reasons, including um, distrust of law enforcement and fear of deportation. And we um, were planning to have a physical outreach, but after COVID, we went ahead and had a Zoom outreach, and it was it was a, a good outreach. We had uh, individuals from actually throughout the country call us and share their stories, and so we want to continue using that platform. With regard to our intake and communication, when we are initially making contact with clients, we are making sure uh, to advise them or ask them if they are in a safe location to be uh, talking to us so that with uh, I, um, social distancing and isolation, they may be in a home with the abuser. We also ask them to have a safe word. So if somebody is calling for assistance um, and we uh, they indicated safety is the issue, we may ask them to know if they don't want to answer a question to say, like, can you move on? Um, the in terms of case strategy this um, isolation has really streamlined the process in the past if there was a case and an attorney took the case if there was a defense we would go to court but now um due to the limited hearings we are um working with clients to explore other strategies um including uh, a lot more mediation just informal mediation to resolve issues um again this is in severe cases, this will be challenging. Um, however, I think working with service providers um, and other uh, support systems um, have been key. Next slide, please. Number of uh, the legal issues that often arise are dealing with custody, visitation, questions about co parenting during COVID. Um, we're still receiving protective orders, um, and we have a number of questions with regard to stimulus payments. With regard to custody visitation and co-parenting, we are encouraging um, parents to continue uh, abiding by court orders, including visitation, if uh, social distancing or um, issues related to COVID is, pre is preventing visitation, we are um, suggesting you do remote visitation. With remote, you also can now mask the uh, screen so to protect your safety. We remind clients to protect uh, or to use that option. With regard to protective orders, as I mentioned earlier, the most severe cases are what are coming to our door. You know, a most recent case, it was an elderly client who did not have access to technology or phone. Um, contacting us about a sexual assault by her husband, and it took um, a number of our uh, uh, our staff and community members to get services and ultimately um, represent this individual in court. Um, with regard to stimulus payments, uh, they were going to the um, person that received the tax refund, um, and that may be an abuser. Um, and it, you would want to, we have been advising um, folks to get the, uh, ask for the money back through advocacy letters. If that is not possible, um, pursuant to the IRS, uh, the spouse or the uh, um, parent who says they're entitled to the money, they actually, in our state, have to file um, a debt action to retrieve the finances, and that's something we may be able to assist with. In addition, um, if the if the party filed for taxes and didn't include the children, they still are entitled to the child credit. And so we have been assisting um, in uh, applying so that the parents can get the child credit um, in the future. Next slide, please. Um, I think the biggest lessons learned is our partnerships. We're all uh, in our office working from home and uh, creating a network has been very important. Um, I'm currently dealing with a case um, where a parent wants to get their children back and um, another party 
um, the uncle is withholding their children. And I think we've gotten the county involved and the police involved and advocates uh, involved from the police station. And it's through networking, um, it, the communication has been quick and seamless. Um, it, while challenging to the client, because the client is going to different parts of the juvenile court um, and they're advised you can't do walk-ins right now, um, if you have to fax or email communications and if the um, client has to print and sign the documents, they might not have that access. And so um, partnership allows for um, us to overcome these challenges. Um, again, outreach is important so that we can continue to advise clients to reach out. Um, and as I mentioned, in terms of in-court advocacy, getting involved early is important so that you can um, set the expectations and stage um, in providing access to your client up front. Next slide. I think that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so I am going to skip over Kathy for just a moment and move on to Ariel because she's still having some difficulty joining the audio. Um, so Ariel, it is your chance to take it away and talk about what SEDEC DC is doing regarding financial crime. Thanks so much. Um, well, I just want to pick up on a lot of the themes that Deepthi's uh, terrific presentation uh, shared. Um, so uh, by way of introduction, uh, Ariel Evanson Waldman from SEDEC DC. At SEDEC DC, our mission is to serve District of Columbia residents with lower and moderate incomes who are dealing with debt-related crises and provide the legal work. We also do systemic work, and I want to emphasize Deepi's point about getting involved early and often in the court committees as part of the systemic work. We often think of systemic work as all about legislation, and legislation is critical, but being part of the nuts and bolts process, the designing of the court's rules and operational procedures uh, can have such profound substantive consequences uh, for the environment that our clients are navigating in. So a plug for that uh, court systemic work as well. Uh, and then third, uh, uh, we do community outreach and education. Um, and all three of the strategies are designed to address the issue uh, of the massive gaps in access to the civil legal justice systems and to the financial systems. We do this work like so many of you partnered uh, with the NLADA uh, as anti-racism work. In the District of Columbia, uh, our typical white families have net assets that are 8,100% that of our typical African-American neighbors. And this, the numbers are similar with regards to our Latina neighbors. Um, the debt collection industry has exploited this gap in the district and, and really throughout the country uh, and weaponized our state court systems uh, to be vehicles for mass lawsuits filed disproportionately against our communities of color. And that's really driven the model of our work, uh, which, which began uh, just about four years ago. Um, we have almost since our inception um, uh, thought it was very important uh, to stand up uh, and separately define a portion of our work to be victims of crime service. Um, and the reasons are, are more or less what you would expect. A lot of people in the debt and financial context uh, have been victimized. Um, I want to identify four areas uh, of this work, uh, debt collection work, COVID-19 specifically, um, victims of intimate partner violence uh, and seniors. Talk briefly about each of those buckets. Uh, and then I want to, um, uh, as NLADA had requested, uh, interrelate that to the funding model um, that the uh, federal VOCA dollars through our state pass through uh, grant programs uh, supports uh, both in the district, uh, but I believe this this structure is available uh, in every state in the country. Um, and so um, we've begun to see uh, some other models similar to ours in the District of Columbia. Our partners at MCJ, the Mississippi Center for Justice in Mississippi, 
uh, have a similar funded program and uh, anything we can do to uh, collaborate or uh, or partner or, or just uh, be a, a listening ear uh, as programs throughout the country are looking at ways to fund this work, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us through NLADA or directly uh, for these conversations. So um, what are we doing in terms of the victims of crime work? First, many debt collection cases themselves involve fraud. Um, you may be familiar, for example, um, in late 2018, uh, the Attorney General for 42 of our states completed a multi-year investigation of abuses by several large debt collection companies um, involving fraudulent robo-affidavits. Uh, and let me just say, uh, my family got a new puppy about two days ago, so you, you're, you're hearing some yelping as he goes into his crate. Um, uh, but uh, in, the AG settlement involves uh, fraudulent robo-affidavits by the debt collectors. Uh, and the allegation, uh, well-founded, was that the debt collection companies uh, had used this, these asymmetries and sophistication to um, generate fraudulent robo-affidavits, attach those to state court complaints, file the state court complaints, uh, so the affidavit basically, uh, basically said, uh, yes, I owe the money uh, and, and created this fraudulent basis for the, for the state court complaint. They attached those affidavits to the complaints, secured judgments, overwhelmingly default judgments in thousands of cases throughout the country. And it wasn't until this investigation uh, uh, resolved that the financial um, uh, consequences in part were addressed through the AG's investigation. However, um, there were lots of things not addressed in that settlement, um, including uh, full compensation beyond the limitations of the settlement, and also individual corrections of the state court dockets. Um, so now in DC and throughout the country, you have uh, folks who have sitting uh, judgments on their court records uncorrected by the uh, AG settlement. And so uh, this is just one example. Our attorney general referred uh, 412 DC residents cases to us out of this uh, fraud. Um, and the numbers are larger in some of the larger state jurisdictions throughout the country. Um, some, of these some of these fact patterns in various forms and various levels of flagrancy and drama uh, have continued uh, in the debt industry. So that's just one example. Second, uh, we are seeing in DC, and I think you're seeing throughout the country, a uh, proliferation of COVID-19 related scams, um, really preying on people's uh, vulnerabilities when it comes to people wanting to access information about their financial stimulus checks, um, information about credit report. Uh, more and more people uh, I think they have um, some money coming to them and are uh, more, even more willing perhaps than usual to provide some basic information about their bank account, um, about their social security number, and all of the risks that go with that. Um, and so uh, in concert with our local law enforcement authorities, we're doing a lot of work to get out education, but also to be available to serve residents uh, in those cases and to be a conduit to law enforcement, be it our state AG, uh, or the FTC, uh, or if the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, in the right case, or maybe in the future when leadership has a different uh, approach to go to the CFPB. Um, third, I want to highlight, and this is something that I think will just be uniform throughout the country, um, the enormous overlap between financial abuse and intimate partner or domestic violence abuse. Um, we know that well over 90% of DV victims are victims of parallel financial abuse. The garden variety fact pattern is um, we hear about the matter in the form of a debt collection case uh, by the debt collector uh, and a client comes to us and said, you know, I never heard about this account. I didn't open this account. I don't recognize this paperwork. Um, it was opened when I was in the relationship with him. Um, he left, I found out 
um, later that uh, the account had been created in my name uh, and now he's walked away from the obligations uh, and I'm being sued and my credit uh, is at risk. Of the credit report, of course, is so central to people's basic ability to have financial citizenship and participation, to access approval, to rental housing, to mortgage approval, to um, uh, loans, uh, and even in many cases uh, to a job. Um, and so um, uh, we are part of a network of providers for victims of crime, uh, and we collaborate closely with our family law providers uh, so that uh, we're able to, in parallel, handle um, uh, folks' challenges when it comes to financial abuse that tethers along with um, uh, family law or, D or DV type abuse. Um, that's the third area. And then the last is um, abuse of seniors. Um, financial crimes against seniors are always a concern. Uh, seniors and, and young adults are, are typically the most vulnerable in terms of statistics to exploitation uh, on financial abuse. I think we're seeing an extra dose of um, exploitation and concern when it comes to uh, seniors uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, as the rules are changing, information is fluid, um, and there's just that many more scammers out there looking to uh, divert funds. The trends in each of these areas uh, really highlight the need to establish, uh, or we would argue grow, your crime victim program. We uh, are already seeing the beginning of, and we anticipate what we're calling a tsunami of debt and credit related problems uh, for the client community um, in late summer and into the fall of 2020 and 2021. Why? People's, you know, wages have gone down. We we all know about the massive, massive spikes in unemployment, the failure of our state unemployment insurance systems to, in some cases at all, or in other cases, fully uh, cover the loss of wages, the stacking up of bills on so many of our client community uh, members' desks or tables. Uh, and then as these billing cycles go by, what we're looking at is a massive spike in the number of delinquent accounts, uh, which is the predicate for uh, a debt collection or a credit report impairment problem. To give a little bit of a historical framework, we went back and looked in the recession that culminated in 2009 to see from Federal Reserve data uh, how serious the problem was a decade ago. And we see there that there was an 84% spike in seriously delinquent accounts defined as 90 days or plus overdue. We anticipate that the spike will be as bad or worse given the gravity and the scope of the COVID-19 financial crisis that's paralleled the public health crisis. And so all of this work uh, to provide both an emergency room and a preventative type approach for the client community, you know, we like to talk about these things from a public health, you know, kind of lens, um, I think, um, where, where organizations can provide that kind of service, I think you, you can get uh, an enormous um, returns in terms of protections uh, for, for the client community uh, and in terms of um, uh, it, having intake for folks who are, of course, so often experiencing other problems and being able to, to do a holistic intake, handle the matters you can directly and refer out. Um, those others. So those are kind of the four areas um, we're seeing, the trend line. Uh, briefly, uh, the only one thing I want to add uh, is that we were asked to talk about the funding model for this work. And we fund this work through two sources. The first is the familiar general support. Um, almost all of our organizations have to do some form of fundraising, uh, and that certainly is part of what we do here. But the second, uh, we want to make sure is on everybody's radar is that the Federal Victims of Crime Act funds, which are appropriated by Congress and distributed as essentially block grants to all the states in DC, have a robust set of funds set aside uh, each year for VOCA work. Uh, and the specific guidance from the US Department of Justice makes clear and explicit as of two years ago uh, that this work encompasses uh, financial abuse and financial fraud work. Uh, and so since fiscal year 18, 
Um, uh, we've been beneficiaries of a six-figure grant um, to help sustain this work. Um, uh, you know, politics is a weird and interesting area, and I'll just note that this is one of the only areas of civil legal aid that has enjoyed bipartisan uh, support. Um, the Republican members of Congress uh, uh, think it's important that victims of crime be served, um, and if that means more help for our clients, um, that's a good thing. Um, and so, uh, unlike some other areas, for example, the president's attempts to kill the funding for the Legal Service Corporation, VOCA funds have enjoyed consistent and growing amount of financial support, and it's an opportunity for we collectively as service providers uh, to draw resources from. Again, as I mentioned, we've uh, been in consultation with our brothers and sisters in Mississippi. We're happy to talk with other organizations uh, in this setting or, or offline. Uh, and again, thanks so much to our partner, to partners at NLADA for bringing us all together, um, especially, you know, kind of in this pandemic era when we're all uh, separated and building on DP's, you know, theme of, of isolation. We also, as, as providers, um, I think have to constantly address the questions of isolation and um, how much you can, you can only get so much connection al uh, along Zoom, but still um, uh, being able to, uh, to partner and draw on the wisdom and experiences of uh, jurisdictions next door from Virginia and all across the country uh, just gives us a needed added boost uh, as we do this work. So hats off to everybody on the call and I'll pause there. Great, thank you. Um, so this might take a hot second to figure out which one is Catherine, but we are going to work very hard to figure out and get her unmuted so she can talk about Prairie State Legal Services. So I'm going to unmute who I think she is with a call in. Um, so, Catherine, can you make sure that your phone is unmuted and tell us if this is you? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yay. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that didn't take so long. <laughs> no, not at all. All right, so the floor is yours. Um, okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for um, not panicking during my uh, technological failures here, um, but I'm glad to be able to call in um, to this program. My name is Catherine Betcher. I am formerly the managing attorney of the St. Charles Office of Prairie State Legal Services, and I'm kind of in transition to becoming the director of family and survivor advocacy for Prairie State Legal Services. And I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute. Um, Prairie State Legal Services, uh, we're located in Illinois. We are um, civil legal aid. Uh, we're an organization that provides services to folks in kind of the top half of Northern Illinois. Um, everything outside of Chicago in that top half of Northern Illinois. So through um, now 11 different offices, we uh, provide services to folks in 36 different counties. And I say now 11 different offices because just uh, two weeks ago, two of our larger offices, the St. Charles office and our Wheaton office merged. Um, and I don't recommend merging slash moving in, during a pandemic, um, but we have now become one large office and um, have combined um, what used to be three in one um, counties being served by two different offices into one. Um, hence my change in title. So Prairie State Legal Services um, has always has been in existence for the last 40 years, has provided all of those kind of classic legal, um, legal aid services to clients on any number of different issues, including domestic violence victims. But in 2017, with the um, with a, a, a substantial grant from the Victims of Crime Act, as, as mentioned by Ariel, um, we were able to staff in every single one of our offices except for one, at least one attorney to do specifically work um, on behalf of domestic violence uh, victims. And this work includes not only um, what, what the, the funding was uh, allowed us to do was to include not only providing services on protective orders, but also expand those services to listen to and, and hear from clients what else they needed in order to get out of the, the situation that they were in, or, or at least to begin that path. And so we're able to provide services on a number of different issues. 
from family law to consumer issues, to public benefit issues, to employment issues, um, to victims as, as a result of this funding. Um, fast forward to the middle of March, um, and we, along with everybody else, <laughs> all of a sudden we're facing um, the, the shutdown of Illinois, um, which has taken a pretty hard line on up until about a week ago, kind of the shutdown on Illinois and folks sheltering in place um, and going from an organization that did almost all of its work, um, you know, hands-on, meeting with clients, being in court, to having to work from home as we all are doing now. Um, so some of the challenges that that presented, besides the technological challenges, um, have to do with the fact that we're an organization that varies differently depending on where you are in the state. So some of our offices um, border on urban slash suburban kinds of counties. Other offices are very rural. The size of the offices um, is uh, is um, very different, again, depending on where you are. We have two, two attorney offices, and now we have about a 30 attorney office with our new newest merger. So that just that fact brings some challenges in, into, um, into providing services for clients because every jurisdiction is different. Um, not only is every jurisdiction different in terms of who we are, but the, the, the agencies on on whom we rely to to work with us with on, with victims um, also are very different from area to area to area, and every single one of them had their own response to the to the shelter in place orders that came down from the governor. So one of our biggest challenges has been to understand in each county who's doing what or who's not able to do what, and then how do we fill in the gaps? Another challenge that kind of goes hand in hand with that is, although the message, um, although, although courts were open to victims of domestic violence, the message almost always started with courts are closed, except for domestic violence victims or except for emergency orders. So a lot of times, you know, what people heard was that courts were closed. And one of the things that we tried to focus on initially was making sure that the word got out in whatever different ways we could that actually for victims, if they could get to the courthouse or they could get to us, um, that, they, that, that, that they would be able to potentially get a protective order. Um, and it you know, we, we, we did that in a couple, in, in a number of different ways. Initially, we reached out to all of our partner agencies, all of the shelters and other programs that we work at with, not only to find out kind of what they were able to do, but also to make sure that they understood that the courthouses were open and that um, we were still working, albeit perhaps not in our offices, um, working remotely, but we were available to go to court and we would be able to represent client victims in court. Um, so that was kind of our first line of defense. We also um, took to the airways or took to Facebook and um, put out messages on Facebook. And as a result of some, those messages, the first round, um, we had, uh, they were, they were um, seen by 3,500 people, shared with, um, and had 48 different shares for the English message and for the Spanish message, uh, 2,700 people and with 27 shares. So that's kind of where we started. Um, then w within each individual office, depending on what the situation was with individual attorneys and what was going on in the individual offices, um, we were creating flyers that went directly to the courthouses, went directly to our shelter partners. Um, in some instances, those flyers gave um, direct lines to employees within Prairie State Legal Services so people could contact them by phone if they could get to a phone in a safe way um, and, and have easier access to talking to an attorney so they wouldn't have to go through our normal intake process. 
And, so, and in some instances, we also had a specific email address that people could email. So again, it would get more directly and more quickly to the people that were providing the services to the domestic violence victims. Again, we also reached out to our partners um, kind of over and over and again to make sure that, that, that um, they understood that we were there. What we were finding with our partners, because in Illinois, and I think this is true throughout much of the country, for most of our offices where our attorneys come into play is at the, at the plenary stage. So we, we pick up cases, if you will, after um, clients have obtained an emergency order of protection. And a lot of times those emergency orders of protection are obtained with the assistance of um, our shelter partners. And um, depending on where you were and depending on the shelters, some shelters were no longer providing those services um, in the courthouses. They were expending their energies and their um, efforts at providing shelter um, and in some instances on beefing up their crisis line. So they weren't able to provide the direct services to folks at the courthouses. So it was really important that we had information at the courthouses so that um, even if people didn't have a shelter advocate helping them with their emergency order protection, they did have information about who to call for the next step of the process. Within our organization, we have one office that has a courthouse project, which we staff with four different attorneys, and we're at the courthouse, the particular courthouse, two and a half days a week, um, working with folks who come in for emergency orders of protection, and then we take the case from the beginning of the emergency order protection to throughout un, until the longer term protective order. Um, in that office, um, the court administration was very determined to, to minimize the number of people coming into the courthouse. And so we had to work directly with court administration to make sure that they, number one, understood that we were still available to do emergency orders, number two, to put together some sort of plan that would minimize our presence at the courthouse while still having us be available for people seeking emergency orders of protection because the courts just didn't want the people in the courthouse. Um, we, again, working with um, administ court administration and the, and the clerk's office, we were able to put together a system whereby we would speak to um, potential clients who had shown up at the courthouse. Um, and they would call us, we would do an intake, we would prepare the documents remotely, and then we would meet the clients at the courthouse um, and, and help and step up with them in front of the judge to get the emergency order. This required not only the cooperation of the clerk's office, but I mean of the court, but also of the clerk's office who created a different system of forms that we could fill remotely and kind of prepare ahead of time to minimize everybody's time at the courthouse, which was the main goal of the, of, the, of the judges at that time. Some of the other challenges that we faced was every jurisdiction, every court ju jurisdiction have different rules. Um, some folks were pretty welcoming to victims, other courthouses were not. And so trying to do the workarounds to make sure that um, people who were able to get to the courthouses could indeed get into the courthouse. Some of the challenges that we uh, came across, and this is probably true for most folks, is that we, you know, people, if they didn't say the right words when they were on the courthouse steps, sometimes they'd be turned away. If they weren't clear that what they were seeking was a protective order or an order of protection, um, or perhaps if they didn't have the right language, um, they might be turned away. A little bit later in the pandemic, a few weeks in, uh, if folks didn't have a mask, sometimes they were turned away. So. And again, every courthouse is different, every jurisdiction is different, so it, it, each individual office had to kind of put their heads down and, and try to figure out what was going to work and what the rules were and getting the word out to the clients. Um, we've spent a lot of time trying to get the word out to the clients about how to access the courthouse. I think that's really been our biggest challenge. Um, a lot of the other challenges that we've had have already been addressed um, very articulately by the two prior speakers. You know, the clients are facing any number of, of barriers, um, being sheltered in place with um, the abuser for periods of time that were probably unlike any period of time that they had before, not necessarily having access 
to um, uh, an hour to be able to talk to somebody, anybody, about what was going on, having the children around all the time, not feeling comfortable talking to the children, all of those issues I know are, are concerns and issues that other programs have been dealing with. So again, I think our, our biggest focus was to, to make sure that people understood that that the courthouses were open, that we were there, um, even if they didn't weren't ready to talk, weren't ready to go forward with an order of protection. We were available, and and tr we tried to make those services as easy to access as possible, easier than perhaps they had been in the past. I think um, in terms of numbers, it, it, our telephone intake system, which is how many of our our folks domestic violence victims and otherwise come to us um, kind of overall during the from about March 20th until now we saw about a 20 percent decrease in phone calls in, in telephone intakes our with our domestic violence victims though the decrease was significantly smaller just just about four percent so I think some of our efforts to uh, make sure that people knew that we were there and we were available and we were um, able to speak to them and work with them, I think some of those efforts were were successful. I, where we weren't perhaps as successful, but we're continuing to work on it, is um, we did see a fairly significant, significant decrease in the number of folks coming to the courthouses. Um, probably, at, at least for the first six weeks, about 20% decrease. Having said that, um, now that the um, Illinois started opening up a little bit um, a couple of weeks ago, and then on Friday started opening up even more, um, and for example today, at our courthouse project that does emergency orders of protection, um, they've been extremely busy. So I think with people feeling more free to leave their homes, I think we're going to now see the other end of um, folks being, you know, feeling like they didn't have the option of coming forward, feeling like it wasn't safe for them to come forward, um, understanding that at times law enforcement was unwilling to arrest because they didn't want to put folks in jail. Um, we've had a number of stories of people um, who called the um, law enforcement for violations of orders of protections and, and you know, we're told they're just not going to arrest. It might be a violation, but they weren't going to arrest because they just weren't going to put people in jail. So that's another issue that we, that the clients have been struggling with and we've been struggling with. Um, and in many instances, it, our solution to those problems has really gotten down into the the connections that we've made throughout the years with various people in these various agencies and, and just making those phone calls and saying, look, you know, this is what's going on. It's a problem. Um, we've been doing that a lot also, as I'm sure other people are, just trying to, to get through the moment and um, get some of these solutions out there for clients. Um, so I think that is, I don't want to repeat a lot of what um, has been said, um, again, probably much better than I can. Uh, we, we are seeing all those same issues with our victims. There's child uh, parenting time issues and questions. There's child support questions, um, the financial impacts of, of, of COVID are pretty significant. Um, and we're going to be we're going to be dealing with those down the line, and it'll be interesting to see again how how the courts are uh, or how victims are respond once they understand or feel more comfortable with coming forward and and getting into the courthouses. And that's all I have. Thank you, um, and I'm happy that we were able to hear you talk about um, the work that Prairie State Legal Services is doing. So now we have moved on to the Q&A portion. Um, please go ahead and send in your questions either through the Q&A box at the bottom right or in a direct um, chat. So we've got a question, um, and this is open to you all. What are the solutions for clients when the police won't arrest? Um, so I think 
Catherine, this, uh, this came in during yours, um, and I think it might be directed mostly to you and maybe Deep D a little bit. And I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? What are the solutions for clients when the, when the police won't arrest? So I, I think what again what we've been doing is working our contacts. Um, we, we you know it, it, depending on what the situation is, um, we uh, you know the one solution is to to talk to the chief, talk to the commander, um, try to understand better kind of what is going on and and explain what why not arresting can be problematic. Um, Sometimes that's successful, sometimes it's not. The other solution, it's a longer term solution, is to work on enforcement um, through the civil courts. Through, um, in Illinois, it's called a rule to show cause, um, seeking a finding of contempt because the abuser, because the respondent, the abuser has, has violated court order. And depending on the nature of the violation, that may be, at the end of the day, a more realistic route to go anywhere. But, uh, but a lot of it does get down to those connections that we've made with law enforcement and and just trying to work those connections and and um, you know kind of talk about the other side of the coin here because I understand what the concern is the concern is they just don't want people in jail, but especially um, when folks are sheltering in place, especially when people just don't have um, many options and don't have a lot of freedom and don't have a lot of access. If there really is a violation of an order of protection, it, it, you know, enforcement, the the hammer of of the of the criminal charge can be really really important because it's only going to escalate. We've had those cases where folks, respondents, abusers have said, "Look, I can do whatever I want. You know, you can't you can't make me leave because you know we're all sheltering in place, or you can't make me leave because nobody's arresting anybody." So it's really important to to um, try to enforce those things as best as we can. Great, and we have another question in, and I think this one is directed towards Deep D. Is the remote filings option limited to a particular county in Nova, or is it available across the board? We haven't heard of that option here in Southwest Virginia, but we've been telling clients about ICANN. Is there any guidance you can give this person? I think it's a jurisdiction specific. Um, this is our Fairfax. Um, and with regards to the other cities and counties we work with, we've been trying to get this up, but it's just logistics and different courts say they have the equipment um, and availability. I know um, general district court are, um, have email addresses um, that you can mail pleading to, but the, still the initial filings, they, they still need a wet signature. Um, and so I think it's just Fairfax for now, but um, as Ariel mentioned, I think you just need to be on the front end because as courts have these transition teams and they're creating policies, I think constantly pushing this option um, has been what's been helpful in moving sort of the bar to get that um, more of a reality. But I think that resource part of it, something we don't concern, has been something that we've been coming across. Uh, the courts have been letting us know as to why they can't have those um, alternatives available. Great, thank you. Um, and we don't have any more questions in from the audience. Oh, we have... Um, We have a question in from the audience uh, just came in. Uh, could any of you speak about the federal funding that you've received um, from LSC over the last few years um, and if and how it's been affected by COVID-19? I should also mention that um, NLADA, if you are a member, uh, we do have a council uh, that provides a guidance advice on LSE related issues. I'll speak briefly about the funding received by LSE from Congress uh, and then invite others to address funding received by organizations from LSE because we're, we're, we're not an LSE grantee, although we think their work is so important. Um, I, this may be, the question may be coming up 
in response to my comment that the Trump administration had recommended uh, elimination of LSC funding. Um, and I think the happy ending to that story is that a bipartisan coalition, uh, including Republican members of Congress who have thousands of veterans who have been uh, given important services by LSC funded organization came together um, and uh, pushed back not only against the elimination of LSC funding, uh, but LSC has received uh, uh, increases in funding over the course of the Trump administration. Uh, and I'll pause there as others may want to address the specifics of their organization's uh, receipt of LSC grant funds. So this is Catherine Butcher. Prairie State Legal Services does receive LSC funding and has for, I think, most of its um, history. Um, and, and it supports all of the work that we do um, for folks who are, you know, financially eligible under the LSC guidelines. Um, and, and as it relates to COVID-19, um, I, I, I know that we were, LSC put forward um, the opportunity to have a tech, um, to provide additional technology to folks um, through a grant process that, and we were uh, fortunate enough to be able to um, increase some of our technology as a result of, of that grant. Um, and it was a very short turnaround and, and um, folks who were working from home and needed equipment um, kind of benefited from that. Yes, yeah, similarly, our sort of, um, we do receive LSC funds and um, since it's tied to the percentage of poverty, our um, organization received more funds just because of the higher poverty rate, which um, sort of balances out uh, the need and resources. Um, and similarly, we also um, recently received funding so that we can um, get laptops for staff um, that didn't have it, and um, we're continuing to look for, looking for that funding right now. Great, thank you all. Um, and with that, we don't have any more questions in, so I just wanna extend a big thank you to all of our panelists. I'm so happy that you were able to attend today and share a little bit about um, what you're seeing in the field and how you're responding. Um, I will make another mention that the webinar slides will be uploaded to our website at nlada.org slash webinars. And you can also find a recording of this webinar uploaded to our YouTube channel. Thank you again for attending um, and we hope to hear from you with, um, with any other questions. I put the contact information for all of the panelists on one of the earlier slides. So feel free to reach out to them if you do. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop the recording um, and I hope you all have a wonderful week.